everyone. Welcome back to the Art of Disney and Pixar week two. So this week we're going to be talking about Walt Disney and his early career up through 1934. This week we'll also be talking about early animation and how it developed leading up to Walt Disney creating the first feature length animated film Snow White in 1934. But first, what I'd like to do is review some of the concepts from last week. So first, let's talk about what are some artistic predecessors of animation and how did these early forms of art depict motion or movement? Well, last week we watched a video that Walt Disney made where he talked about the history of animation. And he talked about things like cave paintings and Egyptian hieroglyphics from the ancient world. And he showed us that they depicted movement by different motions in the images themselves. For example, hieroglyphics were meant to be read from left to right, and you followed the motions of the characters, sort of like you would in a comic book. Next, what is the persistence of vision concept? Remember last week we talked a lot about parlor toys and these very basic toys that help to demonstrate the concept of animation with images. And the persistence of vision is where you have more than one image that are moving so quickly at the same time that your eye can't differentiate or distinguish between the two images that you see. So they look like one image fused together. And this is really important for animation because all animation is is a series of images moving so quickly back to back that you can't tell that they're individual images. Next, why was Windsor McKay's Gertie the Dinosaur important for animation? And remember, we watched this at the very end of last week, and this one was really important because it was the first time we saw a real story in animation, so it had a narrative where Windsor McKay was talking to Gertie the dinosaur from the stage, but also because Gertie had a personality. This was the first instance we have of personality animation or character animation. Gertie was sort of feisty and sort of pushed back at Windsor McKay and didn't really want to participate in the short the way he wanted her to. She had her own personality and that's the first time we really see that in animation. But let's move on to talking about Walt Disney. Just a little bit of background information about Walt Disney. He's born in Chicago in 1901 and his parents are Elias and Flora Disney. He moves to Marceline, Missouri in 1906 with his family to live on a farm. And this is where he starts drawing and learning that he loves to be artistic. He'll also find Marceline, Missouri very, very important to him. Um, later when he builds Disneyland, he builds Main Street USA based on Marceline, Missouri, even though he only lived there for five years from the time he was five to 10. In 1911, he moves to Kansas City, Missouri with his family, and he's introduced to vaudeville and theater there by a family friend. Remember last week when we talked about Gertie the Dinosaur, we noticed that Windsor McKay was showing his shorts at vaudeville performances. So it's very likely that he saw some early form of animation at these vaudeville shows. He also begins a newspaper route with his brother Roy Disney here in Kansas City, which shows how hard he was working. Walt Disney is one of those older men who always was able to tell a story. In my day, I woke up at four in the morning and walked five miles each way to deliver newspapers in the snow before and after I went to school. And a lot of times, because he was doing this paper route, he was falling asleep in class and he was doing very poorly in school. But art was so important to him that he was taking weekend art classes with the money that he made from this paper route and correspondence courses that he would pay for with this money as well. He moves back to Chicago with his family in 1917, where he begins to take classes at the Art Institute of Chicago on the weekends, which is really important because this is where he's learning his fine art training. So he's learning classical techniques. He's also the main cartoonist for his school newspaper. And in 1917, he decides he really wants to join the war effort for World War I. Um, he and a friend decide that they're going to forge the paperwork to join the Marine Corps. And his mother finds out about this and he says, no, 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 no. You are not able to do that. However, knowing that he and his friend are probably just going to take off and actually enlist without her, she agrees to help forge the paperwork for him to join the Red Cross Ambulance Corps. 
which is not necessarily going into battle. He's going to be driving an ambulance for people who are injured. And he travels to France uh, from September 1917 to October 1918. Um, and the armistice or the end of the war happens on November 11th, 1917. So he's only there during the war for about two months. But during his time there, He's drawing a lot. So he draws a lot of cartoons. He draws a lot of images. He sends them back home. This image in the center here, it's dated um, April 18th, 1919. And it's a uh, bunch of drawings in a letter to his school chums is who it's addressed to. And he's talking a lot about, you can see his cartoons, how he wants to go home. So it's not as fun as he thought it might be. When he comes home, he begins working for a commercial art studio in Kansas City. And a commercial art studio is just a studio that creates things like advertisements, theater programs. And he's introduced to UB Iwerks here. And UB Iwerks is going to be really important for Disney's early career. UB Iwerks is the person who is credited with helping Walt Disney create Mickey Mouse. After Christmas of that year in 1918, the company starts laying people off and Disney and Iwerks go to work for the Kansas City Ad Company where he becomes interested in animation when he sees Coco the Clown shorts which were created by the Fleischer Brothers. At this time, he decides that he wants to convince his current boss to try something called cell animation. And we're gonna talk about the difference between cutout and cell animation in just a minute. And he decides to start his own company because his boss won't try animation like this. And he calls the company Newman Laughograms only because they are shown specifically at the Newman Theater in town. So Laughograms was from Disney and the Newman Theater also helped pub publish these, so they put Newman at the front of the name. And the first six of these shorts were modern fairy tales, which sounds familiar to those of us who are familiar with other Disney cartoons. The company officially starts in 1921 and is very successful. He works with Ub Iwerks and two men named Rudolph Ising and Hugh Harmon, who both end up working for Warner Brothers, who creates Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck cartoons later on in their careers. And the company, however, does not do well, and it goes bankrupt by 1923 because the shorts themselves can't keep the company afloat. They're not making enough money from these shorts that they're distributing to just this one theater in order to keep the company safe. But what I'd like to do now is actually watch one of these shorts that the Newman Laughogram Studio put out. This is their version of Cinderella, and it might be a little fuzzy just because it's an older cartoon, um, and the sound you hear, I'd like to point out, would not have been present during this film. So these would have still been silent, and the way the music would have been played was with someone on the piano just underneath the screen playing along to what was happening on the screen. So I'd like to show you Walt Disney's very first version of Cinderella, and then we'll come back and talk about it. <laughs> 
Okay, so I like to show that because it's a good demonstration of a couple of concepts we're going to learn about now. Um, and the first one is what is cutout animation versus cell animation? And cutout animation is the process of producing animations using 2D characters cut from materials like paper, card, or fabric. It's essentially a form of stop motion. And the backgrounds and characters are generally drawn on the same type of paper. And the problem with this type of animation is it's very difficult to move things forward and backward in the picture plane. So there's not a lot of room for depth or perspective. Characters tend to enter from one side of the frame and exit on the other side. These are some examples of contemporary cutout animation. So things like Blue's Clues and South Park are going to be the most familiar versions of cutout animation. But the movements away from the camera towards the camera are very difficult to achieve, but it requires far fewer drawings than cell animation because you don't have to draw one for every motion. You can use the same characters and just take photographs. So it requires less money to do that also. Cell animation, however, is what Disney's known for. And cell animation is where you layer different things on top of each other to create depth. So for example, you may have a background, one character, two characters, and some form of detail. All of these things need to be drawn on the celluloid sheets of paper. And a celluloid sheet of paper is just a um, clear see-through sheet of paper. And they'll all be hand drawn and inked on, uh, which is the process of tracing the animator's drawings onto these sheets of paper. When you cell animate, you allow for more movement, more depth, you can replicate real camera motions, but unfortunately, it requires a lot more money and a lot more time and effort. So that's why when Walt approached his old company and said, let's do cell animation, they said no, because they simply didn't have the money to do it. This is what cells look like on top of each other. So here you can see Snow White and the birds are one cell on top of the background. Here we have a background and Alice and the Cheshire Cat will both be on separate cells. Now I want to talk a little bit about each of the men whose cartoons you watched, because these are going to be Walt's main competitors through the early 1920s. The first is Otto Mesmer, who starts as a cartoonist for local newspapers. He is inspired by Windsor McKay, and he begins working for a company called Pat Sullivan Studios until he's drafted to the war. When he returns from the war, he goes back to Pat Sullivan Studios and he creates Felix the Cat. Otto Mesmer was not acknowledged for being the creator of Felix the Cat until about the 1950s. And in the 1950s, finally someone was like, look, you need to put his name on it because originally it was credited to Pat Sullivan. So since then, Otto Mesmer has been known as the creator of Felix the Cat. Felix was the very first mass marketed and licensed character, which just means that he had merchandise created after him so you could go buy Felix the Cat dolls and toys and all sorts of stuff. Um, and he is the first character created solely for the screen. So he didn't start in a comic book or start as a different story. Max and Dave Fleischer are the earliest American animation studio that is founded. In 1921, they start Inkwell Studios and they gain notoriety for Out of the Inkwell, which you watched one of those, which depicts the brothers drawing characters into life. Then they create things like Popeye and Betty Boop and Coco the Clown, and they're known for their more adult-oriented cartoons. They go out of business after World War II when they're bought out by Paramount, um, but they're known for their dark, sort of grungy-looking cartoons. And they're also known for coming up with this process called rotoscoping, which allows artists to film a scene in live action through film frames that are projected then through glass so that they can trace over those live action movements, which is important for the creation of realistic animation. So to create their Coco the Clown character, Dave Fleischer dresses up in a clown costume, and then Max Fleischer traces over his movements in their live action film and then create realistic movements. They use this a lot for Betty Boop and Popeye to create intricate movements and fight scenes in particular for Popeye. They had this patented technology that they weren't going to share with anyone else, but the patent expires in 1934. So then Walt Disney is able to use rotoscoping to create Snow White, which requires a lot of realistic movement. <laughs> 
And what Walt Disney is doing at this time are the Alice comedies, which you watched one of these as well. And they create this as a solution for Laughograms, which is struggling, but they end up not being able to save the company. So Walt moves to Hollywood in 1923 to care for his boy. And he basically sells off all of his equipment, puts the reel of the original Alice comedy in his bag, and gets on a train. And he approaches this woman named Margaret J. Winkler in 1923, who works for Universal, and says, this is what I've got. Can we do something with this? And she says, let's buy it. So they purchased the short. You guys watched the very first one. And when it's released, it's a huge success. So he and uh, his brother Roy are able to found the Disney Brothers Studio, which later becomes the Walt Disney Animation Studios. And they're convinced this little girl named Alice Davis and her family to relocate to California so that they can make more of these comedies. This is a copy of the original contract signed by Walt and Margaret Winkler. And the story is based on Alice's adventures in Wonderland. And you see this inversion of the traditional cartoons roaming in the world of the artist, where this little girl is now walking around in the cartoon world. This cartoon would lead to Walt Disney getting married when he marries an ink and paint girl that he hires in 1925 named Lillian Bounds. And they distribute these Alice comedies until 1927, when Disney decides that he would rather do entirely animated shorts. And I just wanted to cover some of the key features of early animation that you guys have seen and should have noticed when you watched these few cartoons. One, we usually see the artists themselves, either their full body or a hand, drawing something onto the paper themselves. Two, a lot of these cartoons are basic line drawings with little depth or detail, sort of like a character walking in front of a backdrop. We notice this a lot in Alice's Wonderland because the character herself is actually walking in a white room so that they can overlay all of those cartoons on top. We do get a lot of repeated motions. This was very clear, especially in that Cinderella cartoon we watched, where a lot of things tend to cycle over and over and over again. And that's just because that saves money. So by adding repeated motions, we don't have to spend as much money creating new scenes. The artists will move into the world of the creation or vice versa. So we've seen that particularly with Alice's Wonderland, where the little girl moves into the cartoon world. And finally, there's not a lot of plot in these early stories. There's a lot of emphasis on gag humor or slapstick comedy. So instead of actually telling a story, we're telling a very, very tiny story, but driving the plot by jumping from joke to joke to keep audiences attention. And that's because we don't have sound, we don't have dialogue to tell a story. We're keeping their attention by telling jokes, essentially. Thank you so much for joining me again, and I will see you very soon for our second lecture this week, which will be on the early cartoons of Walt Disney, including Oswald the Lucky Rabbit and Mickey Mouse. I'll see you guys again soon.